How's everyone doing? I hope you're all having a great morning. Thank you for coming here. So when I was leaving Palestine and going through the border, I was humiliated. Not humiliated in the sense that Palestinians are usually humiliated. You know, we get searched maybe 30 times. I think I, I'm the fastest person taking my clothes off in this room. I bet you that much. But, but I'm not talking about that type of humiliation. My masculinity was humiliated because as the Israeli uh, soldier across the window looked at my passport, put in my name and my identity number, the screen began flashing. And she looked at me and she said, you beat up Israeli soldiers? And I look and I'm like, why don't I look like I can beat up some Israeli soldiers? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, w what happened was that on February 24th, 20, on a day after my 24th birthday, I was arrested for participating in a march to open a street that has been closed down to Palestinians in Hebron. And I was arrested for participating in this march. I was beaten up, I was pepper sprayed, and I was thrown into solitary confinement. I couldn't open my eyes for about 24 hours because they didn't allow me to take the pepper spray out. I could barely breathe. I thought I was having an allergic reaction. The room was small. I couldn't see it, but I could sense its size. And it was full of dirt, throw up and feces that they had made me clean up. They had told me to clean it up with my hands initially and I had to use the blanket I had. And uh, I, they didn't allow me to sleep. And uh, I had what you can call a mini breakdown. I began thinking, you know, why am I doing this? Why am I participating in this type of struggle? Why am I working, trying to start my startup in alternative energy in, you know, in Palestine? Uh, you know, it's prison, and I thought that they had accused me of attacking 10 Israeli soldiers, and uh, I thought I was going to spend the next year, maybe two years in prison. I was terrified. They didn't allow me to contact anyone. I didn't know what was happening. And you know this mini breakdown you get when you say, oh my God, my mother and father were right. <laughs> I'm wasting my time. <laughs> well, you know, why am I putting myself at risk? Why am I wasting my time in this type of thing? And I was thinking, you know, why am I doing this? Why am I trying to start this alternative energy company in Palestine that uses integrated solar panels with construction so that it can make it cheap and that people can have these solar panels integrated in their houses uh, and become self-sufficient? And, uh, you know, why am I participating in these marches? You know, I've been shot with rubber bullets, metal pellets. Now I'm arrested. I wanted to go to graduate school. This ruined my plans, uh, you know. And suddenly, a faint voice. I heard the faint voice while I was in that solitary prison. <laughs> Initially, I thought it was an angel singing to me. And then, and then I realized, no, it's my alarm clock. They couldn't, <laughs> they, so they had my phone, my iPhone, in a room nearby, and I guess because I, ha I have a lock on it, they couldn't turn off the lock. And that was my alarm clock, and it was reminding me to actually write this speech. And that's where I wrote the speech. That's where I thought about this speech. And the, the, the first thing I remembered, the speech was initially supposed to be about my project in alternative energy. I was show, going to show you some beautiful pictures, some beautiful technology, design. I was like, you know, once Stanford professors see my designs, once my own professors see my designs, they're just going to be like, you're a genius, you know. But, but, <laughs> but, but I decided, no, I'm going to forget about that. And I remembered a quote by Einstein. And this quote means a lot to me. He says that the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. And I began thinking, okay, the Middle East is full of problems. Let's go up a notch, look at the Middle East, 
from you know, bird view from 30,000 feet and try to figure out what are the problems we're facing, what are the opportunities we have that we can leverage, what, and how we're going to achieve change, how we're going to make the Middle East become a great place. You know, become, I don't want, you know, everyone here has heard of BRICS, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, the rising powers. I want to make it BRIAX. Doesn't sound as good, but I want to add the Arab world to that sector. And I began, when I began, when I looked at Palestine from this Abba, level, I remembered my grandmothers. That's my mother's mother. <laughs> And so, basically, my grandmothers always tell me stories of the past, stories before 1948, stories about the anti-colonial period in the Arab world's history. And they tell me things like, did you guys know that in Palestine, for example, businessmen and women merchants from Syria used to come down to Palestine, you know, sell sweets and so forth. The borders were open and they would actually have Syrian entrepreneurs working in Palestine and vice versa. My mother's, uh, mother's basically my grandmother's father actually used to write books and travel to Egypt to publish the books there. And then they traveled to Morocco. The borders were open and it seemed like, imagine this for a second. Imagine that the Arab world at that period in time had its founding fathers had people who, you know, intellectuals who sat back and said, this is the type of country we want to create. These are the types of institutions we want to have. Let's make the Arab world, you know, a strong nation, a powerful nation. And I was thinking that what they would focus on, based on a lot of psychological research, what makes humans happy. In the end, our goal is to be, you know, happy as human beings, to feel a sense of dignity, are four things. First of all, a sense, you know, basic existence. You need to have enough resources to simply survive on Earth. Once you have that, you want to have a sense of relatedness. By relatedness, I mean you want to feel like you're part of a community, whether it's a family, whether it's your work environment. It makes us happy to feel that we're part of a strong community. That's, you know, that's one of the reasons most Stanford students are happy here, because you feel like you're part of a community that can take care of you. And you want to have competence. You want to feel like you're always improving at something whether that something is your work, whether it's your education, whether it's taking care of your family, it can be anything, but it makes us happy to feel that we're always improving in something. And you need, of course, resources to create that. And to be happy, lastly, you need a sense of autonomy. You need a sense to feel that you're controlling your own destiny, you're controlling your own future. And once humans have these, they, they become happy, they become productive. So you want to create an institutional framework that provides these opportunities, these things to the populations you're dealing with. Well, how do you do that? What are the principles that need to be in this institution, in this constitution? The first principle is freedom. I don't mean freedom as a slogan. I mean freedom in the sense that no one should be forced to follow any laws, rules, or regulations unless they are given an opportunity through a fair and democratic process to elect the people that put these laws in place or to actually put these laws in place directly through lobbying and so forth. That's what freedom means. That's why the occupation of the West Bank is wrong because military orders are imposed on Palestinians. We don't control our destiny. It's controlled by a military occupation. In the West Bank and Gaza, Israel clearly. The second thing is, the second principle is justice. Justice in two types of forms. First of all, justice in the sense that there are a set of basic rights that should be provided equally to everyone. Regardless of your skin color, ethnicity, so forth, we're talking about things like freedom of speech, freedom of movement, and so forth. There are these basic rights that everyone should have equally. And the second principle of justice, and I'm getting this from the, you know, from Rawlsian philosophy, is that those worst off in society should be given the opportunity to achieve the same type of social, political, economic success as those who are best off in society. Which means that everyone should at least have, you know, access to basic health care so that they they, you know, they feel that their children are safe and they themselves are safe, regardless of their income. Everyone should have access to education. So that even, you know, one of the things that really hurt me the second I arrived in Palestine was that I met this young 15-year-old plumber. You think a 15-year-old plumber, you know, and he's, you know, his plan is to just become a plumber because he can't afford to go to school. And I was talking to him, asking him what he enjoys in life. 
and he told me he enjoyed math, you know. I asked him, well, I began giving him some like math questions that he could answer. This 15-year-old is a genius. If this 15-year-old was in the US, he'd probably be at Stanford when he was 16. He could answer questions that sophomore year here at Stanford, my classmates could not answer. And he doesn't have these opportunities. He can't achieve that success. That is wrong. That needs to change in the Middle East. The final thing is dignity. And by dignity, I think we all have an intrinsic sense of what human dignity means. It means that you want to be given opportunities to achieve your potential. You want to be treated like a human being. You don't want to be humiliated. These are the principles that if the Middle East had a found, founding fathers, they would put at the core of the Middle East's constitutions, of the Middle East's bodies, and they would say, well, to achieve these goals, would it be better to have Jordan, Palestine, Iraq, Syria, or would it be better to have an integrated body? They would probably say an integrated body because that's better for the economy because that's how things were moving. Instead, of course, you had colonial powers like Britain, like France, who came and said, oh, we want to draw these borders based on clans, based on one, two, three, four, five. And I think that what these Arab revolutions are showing is that that framework for the Middle East is falling apart. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today, how that is falling apart. But to talk about how it's falling apart, we need to ask ourselves the question, how was it maintained? How did it stay like that for so long? And I think, based on a lot of research done by scholars and so forth, it stayed like that for three reasons. What are they? What are the forces preventing us from achieving our potential? Is it American imperialism? You know, I got a cheap laugh by this picture, but that's good. Is it these bastards? <laughs> you know, they're all gone right now. And I want to just clap our hands to the Libyans, the Tunisians. I mean, we have Tunisians, we have Egyptians here. Thank you guys for getting rid of these, uh, no curse words, for getting rid of these people. And hopefully, there are 18 more to go in the Middle East. Or is it the relationship between American imperialism and these bastards, you know? What's, what's the reason behind this goal, behind the way it is? The reason actually at its core was that after the colonial period, a specific type of power structure was established. Power structure, in some cases, it emerged just because of the anti-colonial process. In some cases, it was pushed forward by the colonial powers themselves. And this structure consists of political elites, economic elites, those uh, basically people who were like mercenaries stealing the resources of a country to achieve their own benefits, and military elites. And in many cases, actually, these, these three groups are not as separate as they look right now. They've merged together. So you find in Egypt that the military elite and the economic elite actually come together at very significant points. And uh, you, know, you find the same thing in Tunisia, for example, where the economic elite and the political elite merged. So these powers were in place. The Arab youth, many of, which are, uh, many of whom are present here today, are tearing the system down. It's falling apart. But the question is, what's rising in its place? What forces brought it down? And what forces are rising in its place? And my argument for today is that the forces that are rising to take the place of these institutions, these structures, are social movements. We've seen a significant rise in social movements in the Middle East. So for example, even prior to the revolutions, do you know that strikes and protests by labor unions actually increased by 500% between the years of 2000, 2003, and 2008? 500%. You know what I read two, three days ago? In Jordan, since the beginning of 2012, there have been 302 protests, a 28% increase from the amount of protests that happened all last year. So these social movements are rising, youth movements, movements for gender equality, different social movements, but they're on the rise. The second force, the second forces are entrepreneurs. You know, basically people who work, social entrepreneurs, people who want to improve society, and business entre entrepreneurs, people who want to make money. Uh, we actually have Serena here at the Arab Reform, at CDDRL, basically. And they, they have a new paper that just came out that I, you know, I came upon when I arrived here. And it actually shows that 
in many cases, over 50% of the youth now are trying to get into entrepreneurship, are trying to work in startups and so forth. They face many challenges, but this movement is rising. And they're challenging the old uh, economic elites, people who made their money basically by stealing other people's resources and so forth. And the last are academics. Academics in the Middle East right now, I'm, I'm doing a master's degree at Birzeit University, and there's a new generation of Arab academics that are challenging the status quo. There were always Arab academics that were challenging the status quo, but there's a new generation of people who are putting new ideas in front of us, people who are talking about social entrepreneurship, people who are talking about social movements and how they rise, people that are talking about how they want the Middle East to look in the future. I'll give you an, a, an example from a small community and then go from there to what I think should happen. This is the village of Nabi Saleh. It's a small village of 500 people in the West Bank. They've been organizing nonviolent protests for over two years right now. And, uh, you know, they just organ they organized themselves. No one came from outside and told this community to organize against Israeli apartheid policies. They, say, they said to themselves, we're sick of this, we want change. But not only that. This, they're beginning right now to work in social entrepreneurship. So someone, someone like uh, me, for example, is saying they have an electricity problem. The infrastructure is not getting to them. So maybe I can help them by installing solar panels for them. And in the, at the same you know, pace, I can benefit my startup, and I can benefit them, and I can benefit the whole community. And they're also beginning to take lessons with academics, legal lessons, you know, how to, how to challenge these you know, laws that, are seg 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 uh, that basically segregate against them. They're beginning to take laws in social entrepreneurship as well. They're beginning to take medical laws. A lot of the women in this village are now studying nursing because you know, a lot of their children get shot or get suffocate from tear gas and so forth. So academics are coming into this community to help them grow. And this is not just happening in Palestine. This is happening all over the Middle East. The challenge I want to put in front of you today is I think that as powerful as these movements are within their own communities, we won't be able to succeed unless we begin to build networks of trust between all the different Arab countries to, because that's, that's how it naturally should have been. The borders that exist between us are fake borders. And the fact of the matter is when I got arrested, a friend of mine from Morocco who's part of the February 20th movement made a Facebook page that began demanding my release. And that Facebook page played a role, and he did it all the way from Morocco, and he got the story out to a whole different community. At the same level, a lot of my friends here at Stanford did something, and that type of community organizing and bringing in different countries, different geographic locations, really brings about change. As a social entrepreneur, someone who works in alternative energy, I can tell you the market in Palestine is too small for my idea to succeed. I think one of the reasons the economy in the US is so robust is because the country is so big, and you can start something in Palo Alto, and it can go to New York within a week, like an app, for example. In the Middle East, we need to do something similar to that. We need to begin understanding that to achieve strong, strong industries, to achieve economic success, to ensure that our startups succeed, we need to begin spreading out of the countries we're working in. That's the only way to do it. And these powers, these powers are going to do it. They're not going to do it because I'm being an idealist. I'm actually being a realist. These are economic forces on the rise. And if we want to understand the way history moves forward, a lot of part of the fuel that pushes history forward are economic interests. Part of the reason that people came out in Egypt and Tunisia and so forth were because they had economic needs. They wanted change, not simply for, to achieve democracy. Democracy is not a goal in and of itself. Democracy is a step towards achieving freedom, justice, and dignity to ensure that you have autonomy, to ensure that you are related to your community, to ensure that you can reach your potential and aspirations. So here they are, these forces growing in small communities. The challenge is, how do we spread them across different communities? And there are reasons, I think, that every single one of us, those specifically from the Middle East, should begin, on, you know, should begin to do this, should begin to spread outside of our own communities. We should work hard in our communities, but spread out. The first is strength and resilience. Like I mentioned, the story from Morocco, for example. The second is, of course, 
economic benefits, globalization, in essence, benefits economies, uh, economic globalization specifically, benefits stronger, benefits strong economies more than it benefits weak economies. And to achieve strong economies, one of the things we need to do is expand the markets we're working within. Like I said, the US is a vibrant market because it's such a big market. And we need to do the same thing to the Middle East. And a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of young people, both academics and people in social movements, are pushing for this. The third reason is diversity of uh, viewpoints. There's a professor at the University of Michigan named Scott Page, and he has a whole book about how diversity, when you're discussing different ideas, leads to more creativity and leads to better ideas generally. And I've actually experienced this fact here during the immense conference. I've had ideas from people from all over, from people from Tunisia, Morocco, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and the ideas and how they approach things, even though we share a relatively similar culture, is diverse. They bring in new ideas and hopefully I'm helping them. But I think most of them are much more creative than I am. But still, hopefully we can benefit each other. And the last and most important thing in my book is building trust. I think that in the future, like Kenneth Arrow, which is a Nobel Prize winner, read this quote with me. You know, virtually every commercial transaction has within itself an element of trust. Certainly any transaction conducted over a period of time. It can be plausibly argued that much of the economic backwardness in the world can be explained by the lack of mutual confidence. And from my experience, the only way to build confidence is to work with someone and to work with someone in the long term. You're not going to trust me even if we share the same culture unless you've worked with me for a long period of time and understand that I am credible. So how do we make sure we keep moving forward? And this is how, uh, this is going to be the end of my presentation. Some of the lessons I learned from my experience both in the alternative energy sector and as a nonviolent organizer in Palestine. The first is you need to remember we are all heroes. It's very important to remember that ordinary people, there's no such thing as you know, a leader who's going to come and change society. When I was in Tunisia monitoring the, the election, there was a man named Abu Mahdi who was our driver. And he was telling me a story about how his company, his taxi company basically, during the Libyan revolution, organized so that they spread out all across Tunisia to get donations from the Tunisian people to send across the border to Egypt. That guy is a hero. Heroism is simply, you always get an opportunity. You're surrounded by an environment. And you can either choose to do the right thing, in which case you become a hero, in which case you help humanity. You can choose to be passive, in which case you are standing with those who are actually causing the harm, the evil people. So remember, and not only remember, but support and mention and talk about those heroes that may seem banal, someone who simply did something simple in society. Just talk about those people, even if what they did wasn't as big as what Nelson Mandela did, because it's these small acts that really change history. The second thing you need to remember is, and specifically in the Middle East, lead from up front when no one wants to be there. When you feel that everyone's afraid, to go to the front lines, you need to run. But make sure you don't leave anyone behind. Make sure that all the talents that you have, you coach others so that they have the exact same talents, so that they have the exact same capabilities. In my book, you're not a leader unless every person you interact with begins to gain the skills that you have. And also, when everyone is jumping in front of the cameras, when everyone wants to be cool, wants to give the speech, da da da, step back. Always give the people who are searching for the spotlight, the spotlight, but make sure that you're preparing them for it. Be credible. Be credible to your people. Have integrity. When you promise something, achieve it. And if you can't achieve what you promise, don't promise it to begin with. The Arab world, the Arab people now don't believe in credible leaders anymore because none of their leaders have been credible. And as this young generation, we need to change that. We need to make sure that we're credible. Even a small promise, we need to keep. And because there are also you know, American young people here, I think there's a lot you can do. But one of the things you guys need to keep in mind is that a quote by Henry David Thoreau is to ensure that you do not lend yourself to the wrongs that you condemn. 
which is that if your country is doing something that is violating values that you hold dear, that your country holds dear, the first thing to do isn't to go and say, oh, I'm going to give people in the Middle East money so that they can survive this hardship. It's to go and tell your government, I want you to change these policies. That's always the most important step. And that's an ethical obligation. And finally, we can't give up. This is my, a friend of mine from a village called Nabi Saleh. His name is Mustafa Tamimi. And he was killed three months ago. That's why we can't give up. Martin Luther King said that deep in our nonviolent creed is a conviction that there are some things so dear, some things so precious, some things so eternally true that they're worth dying for. And if a man happens to be 36 years old, it was the age when Martin Luther King was assassinated. And he refuses to stand up for that which is right. Then he's just as dead at 36 as he would be at 80. And the sensation of breathing in his lungs is merely the belated announcement of an earlier death of the spirit. He dies. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for that which is right. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for justice. So are we going to stand up right here? From what I've seen at the men's, I believe so. Thank you very much.